Okay, so building, I guess, on the, on the previous presentations there to examine the drivers um, of health and hospital care expenditure um, uh, and, and the, the demographic and macroeconomic inputs, um, this presentation will now move on, as, as Adele said, to present findings in terms of, of projections of expenditure for public hospital, hospitals in Ireland uh, to 2035. Um, uh, I, just before I begin, though, I guess it's 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 important to highlight that a, a number of of ESRI colleagues have contributed to this work. Um, so uh, Aoife Adele and, and May Van are all, all speaking today, um, but also Edward Henry, um, who's, who's left us now to pursue a PhD in Galway, and and Richard White, who's doing a PhD in Trinity, were also kind of really important in developing up this work. So I just think it's important um, to acknowledge them uh, before we start. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into the findings, uh, we're a little tight in time here, um, but there's much more detail in the report in terms of the, the data sources underlying um, these projections and, and the definitions underlying the analysis as well for those that are interested. Um, what I will say, however, is that this analysis focuses exclusively on care in public hospitals um, and expenditure in public hospitals, however that care is, is financed, whether it's, it's publicly financed or privately financed. Um, it excludes expenditure on private hospitals, um, but I'll come back to this later where we are looking at that now in a separate analysis. Um, but I, I, and just say that a measure of expenditure is a measure of current expenditure, so it doesn't include um, kind of um, capital expenditure or depreciation, which would which would really require a separate a separate set of assumptions and a separate a separate analysis. Okay, so we know in, in 2018 um, that 5.9 billion was spent in public acute hospitals on delivering care. Uh, and the majority of, of that care delivery um, related to admitted care, so day patient care and inpatient care. So inpatient care accounted for about 3.2 billion. In 2018, day patient care uh, just under a billion. That was then followed by outpatient care at about 676 million and emergency department care at 419 million. Um, but I guess when, we, when we, we aggregate up those service level um, measures of expenditure, um, we're left with a bit of a shortfall. So um, there, there's about kind of 670 million out of the 5.9 billion that we can't explain from aggregating up kind of what we think was spent on those services, those four main acute services in 2018. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions with the healthcare pricing office about what this might be. And while it's, it, it's difficult to fully reconcile um, what, what that residual is, um, we think that a large proportion of it relates to things like um, hospital expenditure on external services. So this is, for example, hospital laboratory testing uh, that takes place for primary care providers. So while it's a cost to the hospital, it's not necessarily related to the activity taking place at the hospital, so we, we, we don't capture it. Um, we also don't include a small proportion of outpatient expenditure captured in non-activity-based funded hospitals uh, and any care outsourced um, by public hospitals, so I think it's just important to, to, to mention that. Um, finally, then, outside the acute hospital budget, this analysis also looks at spending on acute adult psychiatric inpatient units in 2018, and, and, and that expenditure comes from the, from the mental health budget, and we, met, we measured that at about 179 million in 2018. Okay, um, so first consideration when developing these expenditure profiles um, and the projections is, is to understand the unit cost. Um, so the unit cost of care really relates to the, um, the average cost of, of service delivery for a different service. Um, and you can see there from the graph that it, that it varies widely. So um, for outpatient care, um, you're looking at kind of 171 euro on average for, for, for an outpatient visit, um, all the way up to kind of just under 5,000 euro um, for an inpatient stay in 2018. Um, and we can also then break up those um, unit costs by component. Um, and you can see there that the, the, the proportion of the unit costs related to, to each of the components um, varies significantly across services. Um, so we've kind of broken up there into pay, uh, into non-pay uh, and, and within non-pay, non-pay drugs, um, 
uh, which I said, we're, we're going to look at kind of a modeling, modeling hospital drug expenditure separately and then and, and, and non-pay other. So non-pay other relates to kind of all other non-pay costs, you know, heating, electricity, lighting, admin, uh, overheads, whatever it may be. Um, and I guess what stands out from this graph is that across all services, pay is the single largest component um, of care costs. So accounting for about um, three quarters of the cost of delivery of, of, of ED care, down to about half the cost of, of, of delivery of day patient care. For day patient care, you can see there that um, you know, drugs accounts for approximately a quarter of delivery of, of the cost of care, uh, which is kind of significantly different from the other services. Um, and I guess this, this makes sense if you consider the type of care that takes place in the day patient setting, uh, which may have a high drug component. So the best example is, example is probably kind of the high volume cancer care that relies on kind of chemotherapy that, that, that takes place in the day patient setting. Okay, so combining those unit cost profiles with the underlying activity rate profiles uh, generates our baseline expenditure profiles. So this graph here um, shows baseline age and sex-related expenditure per capita, per capita profiles um, for two of our services, outpatient, uh, outpatient care and inpatient care. Um, so looking at the outpatient graph there first, you can see a steady rise through the age distribution um, for both males and females um, in terms of per capita expenditure up to about um, kind of 70 or 80 years of age. Um, in terms of the inpatient graph, we see broadly a similar trend, um, but I guess with a couple of important distinctions. Um, so you can see for the inpatient graph, per capita expenditure rises much more rapidly at older ages and also peaks at older ages. Uh, and this difference between the outpatient and the inpatient profiles is a really important, is a really important point in terms of projections, because what it means is that the, the inpatient profile going to be much more sensitive to changes in the population age structure and to aging of the population than, than outpatient care and that will have imp implications as we see for um, projected differences in expenditures. Okay so now moving on to our findings in terms of our projections. Okay so this, th this slide presents a table of how we group um, our demand and cost assumptions together into three main projection scenarios. So a low pressure, a central and a high pressure scenario. Uh, so in terms of demand, we vary assumptions in relation to population growth and aging, um, driven by the, 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 the population projection assumptions that Dell discussed. Um, we also um, introduce vari variation in our demand assumptions in relation to healthy aging. So under a low pressure, we assume quite optimistic dynamic equilibrium healthy aging, uh, and then progressively more pessimistic healthy aging in a central and high pressure scenario. Uh, in terms of cost, we vary assumptions in, in relation to pay, um, guided by the, the Cosmo macroeconomic projections that Adele discussed. Um, we split our non-pay non projections into component related to drug costs, and those drug cost increases uh, that we project through the horizon are based on kind of historical growth in, 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 in hospital drug costs. Uh, and then our, our other non-pay items um, are, are kind of linked to economy-wide economy inflation plus, um, plus, a, plus a markup that varies across our scenarios. In our projections of, of total gross acute hospital expenditure, we also introduce another scenario, a progress scenario. And this is based on the assumptions of our central scenario with, with, with two additional assumptions. So one relates to the issue of waiting list management, and this affects outpatient and day and inpatient projections. And here we look at kind of the extra activity um, required to clear for backlog clearance between, between the period kind of 2021 to 2025. Uh, and then also the additional activity and cost that will be required to sustain waiting times, sustain lower waiting times into the future. Uh, we also introduce assumptions on avoidable hospitalizations, um, which I've discussed previously, and, and really this, this relates to expenditure of ED care and day and inpatient care. And here we linearly reduce the rate of avoidable hospitalizations each year, um, converging to a 33% reduction by 2035. Okay, so this table shows uh, projected growth rates and expenditure between 2018 and 2035 for our, our main services, both in real and nominal terms. 
Um, so our real projections um, hold, our, hold our cost constant at, at, at 2018 value. So they're essentially projections of volume. Um, while our nominal projections allow both volume and cost um, to vary through our projection horizon. Uh, and I guess an important point um, to highlight from this table uh, is that the projected increases in both real and nominal terms are graded for our admitted care, so for our day and inpatient care compared to other services. And an important factor in this is that these services are, these, these day and inpatient services are used more intensively by older age groups uh, and then are much more sensitive to projected demographic change. And again, that's going back to that slide I showed you um, with the age-related per capita expenditure profiles that differ between outpatient and inpatient care and inpatient profiles where, where, where care was much more, um, expenditure was, was, was much greater in, in older ages. Um, so again, so focusing on these services, again, just to kind of highlight that, you can see in real terms, outpatient expenditure is projected to increase between 12% and 18% over our horizon. Uh, inpatient expenditure in real terms is projected to increase between uh, 25 and 38% um, to 2035. In nominal terms, again, you're seeing kind of greater, greater expenditure increase um, for, for, for inpatients relative to outpatients. So for outpatients, you're seeing uh, a projected increase of between 63 to 108% across our scenarios, but for inpatient care, it's higher, so 86% uh, 86 to 150%. Um, across our, our projection rise. Um, and, and as kind of Mer said earlier, the, 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 these projected increases are, 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 I think he described them as frightening. Um, and, and they are when you consider them in this context, but it, it's also important to remember that these relative growth rates are going to be a function of the length of our projection horizon. And here we're projecting out to 2035. So another a useful way to consider these increases also is in terms of, of annual average change. Um, and here we can see, I guess, across our real and nominal projections and across our, our services, services and scenarios, um, we're seeing kind of annual average percentage growth in expenditure at the low end of about 1% per year, um, up to about 6% per year uh, at the very high end. So again, focusing, um, for example, on, on outpatient inpatient services and, 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 and here just on nominal expenditures, you can see for outpatient care, we're projecting Annual average increases of between three and four percent uh, per year through our horizon, um, and for inpatient care, that that's four uh, percent uh, on average per year, up to six percent on average per year. Okay, so this table now decomposes our nominal expenditure growth into into demographic, so population age structure, population growth, and non-demographic drivers, or so our pay and non-pay drivers. Uh, again, picking out. Uh, outpatients and inpatients as an example. Um, so first picking up on the point from the last slide, we can see aging contributing proportionally more to the growth in inpatient expenditures relative to outpatient expenditures. And again, just to highlight that's going back to the difference in the underlying age and sex related per capita expenditure curves. Really, I guess the key finding that jumps out from, from this slide um, is that, is that cost and particularly pay would be by far the largest driver of, of projected hospital expenditure. And, and this makes sense if we, if we think back to the slide in our unit cost breakdowns where we showed that majority of the cost of service delivery in 2018 um, relates to pay. Um, and then projecting that pay into the future as kind of Adele discussed, um, that's driven by assumptions on, on government sector earnings over the period. Um, which themselves are linked to, to, to pay in the wider economy. So again, getting back to this FOMO effect. Uh, and this is probably one of the key findings of our analysis and, and I'll come back to it later in the presentation. Uh, I also want to show you the, the day patient expenditure decomposition because these are slightly different to the other services uh, in terms of the potential impact of drug costs on, on projected expenditures. So if you remember back to the, the, uh, the, the breakdown of our, 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 our unit costs and, and the fact that, hot, that um, the drug component um, of, of, of the, the cost of day patient care delivery was much higher than for the services accounted for a quarter of the, the, the cost of delivery of day patient services. Uh, and, these and these drug component costs have historically experienced high growth rates. So if these trends continue, in, in, in terms of hospital drug costs, and um, these could add significantly to future expenditures on day patient 
We can also then aggregate up our service level expenditure profiles into a measure of, of, of gross expenditure uh, and project from that basis. Um, so in nominal terms, we project gross expenditure requirements for public acute hospital care um, between, of between 10.8 billion and 14.4 billion by 2035, compared to expenditure of 5.9 billion in, in 2018. Uh, and this this relates to over that period uh, a projected increase in expenditure of between 82 to 143 percent across our scenarios. Um, but again, it's 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 useful to consider these these expenditure projections in in average annual terms. Um, so if you look at the last row of this table, you can see that um, across our scenarios, we're projecting annual average increases in in total hospital expenditure. Of between 3.6 and 5.4 percent um, per year. Uh, and for context, um, we can see that the, the over the over the of the previous five years of of uh, prior to 2018, that the average annual growth in hospital expenditure um, in gross hospital expenditure was 4.5 percent, and that kind of falls uh, within our our projected range into the future. Um, and so, for, and, and for our projections of gross hospital expenditure, then we also introduced this additional progress scenario. Um, so while this is modelled on on our, our central projection scenario, we, as I said, we introduced two additional assumptions, and 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 and, and these two assumptions, I guess, have, have kind of um, differing effects on our, our our projections. So, in one instance, we have our avoidable hospitalisation assumptions in, in, under assumed improvements of primary care, we're reducing some of the avoidable hospitalisations being reported. Um, being reported in, in in the acute system through our horizon, and that's have a kind of a, 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 a downward effect or a downward pressure on, on expenditures. But at the same time, as those resources are freed up, we're introducing additional activity and, and additional cost into the acute system, dealing with waiting list backlogs and, and, and making sure we can maintain lower waiting times. And over the short term, out to 2025, we can see that actually the progress scenario introduces greater expenditure pressures than the central scenario. And the reason for that being that up to 2025, we're, we're, we're assuming much greater activity is taking place in terms of reducing backlogs um, that have built up for, 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 um, for access to, ele to elective care. Um, but over, over the entire projection period, then what we see is that actually, um, the progress scenario results in, in, in slightly lower projected annual average growth than the central scenario. And the reason for that being over the entire period is the impact of, of reducing our rate of avoidable hospitalization and the incremental increase in, in assumed primary care improvement that is that is is is, is reducing projected expenditure growth to, to a certain extent. And by 2035, we estimate that um, relative to the central scenario, that under the progress scenario, we're saving somewhere around kind of 300 million per year uh, under the progress scenario. Uh, and then, and then in, 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 in our analysis of gross hospital expenditure as well, we also introduced one additional um, scenario, which we termed the central adjusted scenario. Um, <clears throat> And what we're really doing here is assessing well, what impact does the big expenditure shocks that have taken place last year and, and, and will take place this year, uh, what effect will they have on our projected growth path? <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so really what we're doing here is we allow for a 10% increase in the public acute uh, gross hospital expenditure uh, in 2020, a 15% increase in 2021, <clears throat> with flat expenditure in 2022. So this is the net effect of um, <clears throat> assumed removal of, of COVID supports that year, but also the, the, the increase in demographic and cost consideration. And then a return to our central projection path thereafter. Uh, and what it really shows is that these adjustments um, to, our, to, to, to our funding in the short term, to our expenditure in the short term, really have both permanent and temporary dimensions. But that apart from the early projection years, um, we can see that the, um, the the projected growth under the central adjusted scenario doesn't fall outside our projected range. So if you get into look at the last row of the table there, you can see under a central just a central adjusted scenario, um, projected annual average increase of about five point one percent, which is in the, within the range of our our low central and high um, scenarios. <clears throat> 
Okay, so uh, just to summarise then, um, public acute hospital expenditure in 2018 was, was 5.9 billion. Uh, this is projected to increase by between 1.2 and 1.7% on average per year in real terms to 2035. Uh, this being driven by a growing and an aging population. Uh, in nominal terms, then we're, we're expecting projected increases in annual average terms of between 3.6 and 5.4%. Um, this being driven mainly then by the increasing cost of care delivery and particularly pay. Um, we also have identified, though, um, variation in, in projected expenditure growth across our different services with projected growth greatest for acute day and inpatient care. And again, why is that? Well, the, these services tend to be used more intensively by older ages, so they're going to be more sensitive to changes in the population age structure. We can also complexity adjust these profiles. So not, not only do we know that older individuals use these services more often, um, but when they do use the, those services, they consume, consume more resources as well. Uh, and as I said, for day patient care particularly, um, you know, it's the, the cost of hospital drugs could be a, a significant driver. Okay, so in terms of policy implications, what does what does this all mean? Um, so I guess the projected demand we've identified um, in this analysis will require significant investment in capacity uh, and also workforce. And this includes additional resources to address um, the unmet demand for care. So the wait, the 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 the, the waiting list backlogs and, and the long waiting times that that have arisen. Uh, and if we'll cover this, how we do this in much more detail in session two. Um, but at the same time, some acute care could be more appropriately delivered in the community. Um, so we, we, we've developed or could be more appropriately delivered or even prevented in the community. And we've, we've identified, identified kind of the three main avoidable hospitalizations that are currently consuming acute care resources that could be delivered in the community. So vaccine um, preventable flu and pneumonia. Um, urinary tract infections and, and, and COPD. And while these would be expenditure saving to the acute system, uh, they would in turn require investment in, in community care. Um, and we haven't modeled that, 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 that community care investment in this report, but um, I guess the counterpart to the acute expenditure report is taking place this year where we're modeling non-acute expenditure projections. And we hope to incorporate some of that additional community expenditure in that report. Uh, an important, I guess, an import, as I said, an important um, finding from this this analysis is 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 the impact of cost and the impact of 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 of, of pay, particularly, will have on 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 future expenditure projections. So that kind of raises the question: Well, what's the role for productivity in offsetting some of these projected cost increases? Um, and we did look at this in the report. So in in terms of a sensitivity analysis, we showed that even small reductions in the input cost per projected output, so a measure of productivity, uh, could result in material expenditure savings. Um, so so how do we go about achieving these 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 productivity improvements? Well, I guess an important aspect will be ensuring that we have adequate workforce in place into the future and appropriate skill mix, um, to allow for productive delivery of care. Uh, target investment in things like information and communication technology are also likely to, to be important and to facilitate um, productive working into the future. Um, and I guess given the cost pressures identified in this analysis, a, a policy focus on, on, on factors like this um, will become increasingly important. Uh, and finally, in terms of the implications, um, just to say that, you know, finishing on a positive note, uh, demographic change should be welcome. So we have a growing population. We, we have a population that's living longer and often better health, which is a good thing. Uh, and while additional resources may be required to, to finance these care needs, they, sustainability should be viewed, I guess, in the context of a, a growing national income and a, a growing tax base that, that may help with, uh, or should help with, with kind of um, meeting some of these future care needs. Okay, so what's next for Hippocrates? Um, so, so this year we've kind of we've a number of ongoing research projects. Um, most immediately, I guess, um, I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, we're, we're, we're undertaking analysis of projections of private hospital expenditure to 2025. Um, this analysis was originally due for inclusion in the original um, acute hospital expenditure report, but we just didn't have the necessary data available in time. 
uh, we have those data now, so we're planning to publish this piece as, 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 as an, an academic piece of work. Um, I guess important included in these projection scenarios will be a piece of work where we consider um, how projected demand for private hospital care might change if, if private practice is removed from public hospitals, which is a consideration under Sancho Care. And this involved a detailed analysis of the type and complexity of, of private care currently taking place in public hospitals. Uh, we're also, as I said, looking at a kind of um, a, a counterpart to the acute expenditure report and non-acute expenditure projection report to 2025. Uh, this is more challenging in, in a lot of respects due to um, due to data constraints. So we have much more information available on, on on that in the acute care sector than we do in in, in the in the community. But we've had good engagement with the HSE in terms of available data. Uh, and work done by um, Samantha Smith and, and others in Trinity in developing recently non-acute unit cost profiles um, will be really important in informing this analysis. Um, and then finally, in, in, in terms of HSE funded work, we're also using Hippocrates, which fundamentally is a demand-based model and using those demand projections to look at, well, what, what are the associated workforce requirements into the future? Uh, and with a particular focus on the rollout of community health networks and expanded primary care. Uh, and an important aspect of this, this analysis will be, will be the regionalization of Hippocrates. So Hippocrates at the moment projects at a national level, um, but for this bit of work, we'll be developing Hippocrates to provide regional projections of demand and workforce, um, which will hopefully provide important information um, that doesn't exist right now in terms of resource planning. Okay, so uh, before I finish, I guess it'd be remiss of me not to um, conclude with giving a big thank you to our data providers who made all this analysis possible. Uh, but not only in terms of data provision, but uh, to deal with, I guess, the many, many questions we had at, at various points uh, in developing this analysis. Um, so they're all incredibly helpful.